Back in my 20s, the M5 had major mystique, and that is primarily because of the BMW films with Clive Owen. Watching him tear that car around made me want one so badly, and as I've gotten older, I've driven every single iteration. And now we have this, the F90. And when I first saw the sticker price on this, the one that I'm driving, at $132,000, I almost choked on my own tongue. It has an $8,500 carbon ceramic option, the Bowers and Wilkins setup, the executive package, but the competition version without all that starts at $110,000 and you start to think, well, this better do some serious driving and <laughs> it better do a lot for that type of money. So let's get onto the interior stuff. All right, I'm gonna close this door because it's a tornado outside. Ah, uh, yes. The refinement, the comfort, the massaging seats, the soft closed doors. There is so much creature comforts in here that it is the, one of the most confusing sports cars I've ever been in. Now, granted, this is trying to be that sports sedan. And in the sports sedan market, this does not have that many competitors. And once you start to wrap your head around how insane the performance is, you wanna know that for this money that you're gonna be able to utilize this every day. So in terms of interior comfort, the seats are pretty good. I'd say they are on the sportier side. They're a little bit more firm and this does not have a ton of miles on it. So they might need a little bit more break in, but it depends on your body type greatly. There is so many adjustabilities, bolster adjustments, thigh cushion adjustments. I mean, it, it's going to take some uh, fiddling to get comfortable in here. Now this has the pumpkin spice latte interior choice, and I don't even know if that's what it's called, but that's what it reminds me of. There's the black lines of leather do down the center edge of the seat, the M5 logo, and pretty much everything else is black. And it depends again, who you are, how you would option this out. The headliner has this microfiber-ish Alcantara feel to it. It's really soft. You can tell it absorbs a ton of noise energy or sound energy. This is an insanely quiet cabin despite it trying to have this boisterous, loud personality in terms of exhaust note. Now, the steering wheel design is typical M stuff. It feels great. You have your two M buttons on here, so you can basically go into the infotainment, program in all the settings that you want, so you have basically two presets, one, probably one for each driver. And I find that that is one of the most useful things on this car because one of the biggest negatives about this interior is the complexity of all the electronic systems. And I'm gonna go over that briefly here. You have the engine or the, well, driving dynamics button that you can switch from sport, sport plus, efficient, and then you have your damper settings, which have sport, sport plus, comfort, and then you have your steering setting, and then you have your all-wheel drive setting, and then you have your exhaust button to turn it on off, and then you have your traction control mode, you have MDM mode, you have DSC off, you have DSC on, and there is this, you're just being inundated by all of these settings, and, and I'm gonna be straightforward with you, I think it's too much, it is, this is the epitome of where electronics and technology have taken over a car and have made it just, it feels like uh, I'm going through a computer like control panel setting to try to, to get all these settings set up. So thank God they have these shortcut buttons on the steering wheel because it's gonna drive many people nuts. Once you have it set, it is really, really intuitive in terms of the classic iDrive menu system. If you've ever used this before, it's quick, it's easy to use once you know how to get in and out of it. Um, and you know, everything mostly works. This is one of the most matured, most uh, developed pieces of software, the center gauge cluster, the iDrive setting, the now you have digital HVAC controls, but they're all below here where you know it's touchscreen. It's kind of annoying, but at least it's separated from the infotainment a little bit. I feel like most of the stuff, once you get used to this, 
you'll really like using, but it's going to take you some time. All right, the next big thing about this interior space is at night, this feels like some type of Russian dance club in here. The way that the lighting is done is preposterous. You have all these different controls for your LED lights, your accent lighting that runs across the dashboard, the doors, and even the speaker grills are illuminated. And I think, truthfully, there is a cool factor to this. I'm not gonna lie. I found myself playing with this constantly, tweaking the colors, changing the brightness just to get it right. And it is the attention to detail that lighting brings to a cabin that is really neat. And, you know, I turned it off because I'm like, it's very distracting. And then I thought to myself, well, it just doesn't feel as special of a space. I think the way that they've done the lighting package is really good. And I think a lot of people are going to love it. Now, one of the other huge pros, and this is more indicative of the 5 Series, but specifically with this car, you want to opt for the $3,000 option Bowers & Wilkins setup. Their engineers know how to do car audio. And this was apparent when I tested the Volvo V60 that had the Bowers, and now I get in here. There's virtually no rattles or creaks. There's no vibrations coming from this car. The frequency response is linear. It's not all jagged or spiky, and it's good in pretty much every single seat in this car. Driver, passenger, rear seat, it sounds good in pretty much every configuration. When you move your head, you don't hear the sound stage or the volume levels uh, change, and it does pass CD quality audio over Bluetooth. And pretty much every sound mode you choose in here it's just a, it's just one of the better car audio setups you can get for under 100 grand and granted this is over 100 grand but it's one of those you just have to listen to to appreciate now obviously you probably don't care about all that stuff let's talk about the technical aspects of the m5 before we drive the pants off of it let's head to the shop welcome to the underbody segment with the F90 M5 competition on the Ben Pack lift, and everybody's been asking where Scott has been. I'm waiting for a premium cars. Yeah, right. You know what I told him? <laughs> I think it, it broke down. That's why you called me. You need to start it for you. <laughs> I need you to push it into the garage. <laughs> now, Scott's been busy getting his shit pushed in in the Starbucks bathroom for the past couple months. <laughs> How many lattes have you had? Ah, to... Where's my latte? Hey, let me go get it for you. <laughs> No, it's a grande Java chip frappuccino with oh. peppermint. Oh my God. Dude. This is the perfect car for you. Right, let's get into this, Scott. We've both driven this, but we're not going to talk about the driving part. We're going to talk about some of the mechanical aspects. What do we got? A big old V8 with some turbos. Yeah. <laughs> and some monster brakes to go along with it. That's true. That's all you need. Yeah, exactly. Just Auto trans, just the way I like it. <laughs> you, you like it all automated? Quick, quick flaps. Yep, and about 16,000 different drive modes. You have a full double wishbone suspension. All aluminum componentry, lower control arms, the fork, the knuckle is massive, your upper A arm is aluminum and it is all stamped with m on it so yes. you know that these are m specific suspension even, parts. even the shock tube is thick <laughs> yeah. it's thicker than most exhausts on cars i know it, it's rich and meaty and you also have adjustable dampers that are electronically controlled do you know why they're adjustable why so you get that creamy handling oh is that what the press release said yeah. <laughs> so yeah you get creamy handling now people are going to wonder you know this is essentially an m5 that's tarted up for more performance so they did make some changes here from regular m5 like they've lowered it seven millimeters you have thicker anti-roll bars front and back they are pretty massive they are massive and i'm sure they're solid i didn't even check can yeah we, can yeah, we cut solid. one open real quick yeah let's just saw it off <laughs> uh, so the anti-roll bars are thicker they're mounted on a different mount in the front for rigidity your motor mounts are more rigid to improve direct steering feel back to give you more. Oh yeah, because it feels so direct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. Now, there are some other things included in the suspension, Scott. You have increased spring rates. And the damper profiles are more aggressive from the regular M5 on the competition. And of course, they've added more horsepower, more torques, 
That it has plenty of. Yes, it's got more than what you would expect from this thing. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna move to the back end and we're gonna talk about the rear suspension, the transmission, and the all-wheel drive system. Scott, we made it to the back and there's still a lot to talk about. And one of the things I skipped over in the front half of the vehicle is the optional carbon ceramic brakes for about $9,500. That's an option on this. That's a good deal for the option, considering yeah. they're twice as much to replace it. How much is it to replace these brakes? 18000 Yeah. So we got a quote, which you can see Well, that's see without labor, too. That's without labor. This is the quote to do pads and rotors on the carbon ceramic version of this. And I'm going to talk about that briefly. You drove it. And we, were, we weren't timing this because you know, this wasn't a competitive thing. It was about learning about the car, how it handled, and exploring all these systems. And when you really drove it, I'm going to kind of show you a partial lap here. got back in those front brakes were smoking and we put the thermal you know temperature gauge on it <laughs> 800 and, and something like, degrees it was close to 900 <laughs> degrees right and i think that's where this gets confusing and i'll just put it that way you have a big ass heavy car you have insane brakes you have all this insane performance but you can't hide the weight so if you're somebody that's going to take this out on track and you're gonna burn through brakes and rotors, you're gonna burn through tires, you better at least have 20 to 30 grand set aside for consumables. Or just put steel rotors on it. Just put the regular steel rotors on and chew through those instead. Yeah, but even at 900 degrees, there was absolutely no brake fade at all. But we didn't, I mean, how many, how, how many times did we go around at Well, a that time? was after what, three, four laps of just getting the filming done. You pulled in right. after three or four laps and that was legitimately the circumstance. And that's the truth of this. Uh, I had, because this is not my own car, I had a phobia of going out there and driving it excessively because I was worried about consumables. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was kind of thinking about it as if it was my own car. And, well, and as you should, yeah. to a point, I mean, you can't go out and destroy these things unless you had like a top gear budget where you right. can, here's, here's 10 more, I broke your car. Right, exactly. So, I mean, I kind of approach it the same way an owner would, and it's something you absolutely have to know. Yeah, the buy-in for the brakes is cheap, but the replacement is not. The next thing is BMW's X-Drive all-wheel drive setup, and this is a first on an M5. They've never done an all-wheel drive setup on here before. And the way that it works, you have your transmission, which is your traditional torque converted BMW automatic, which is one of the best in the business. It's very good. It's very good. It's made by ZF. And then of course they do all their tuning on it. And then you have a multi-plate clutch that can decouple itself to go into rear wheel drive mode if you choose it. It's amazing. <laughs> you have to have all the stability control systems off to be able to toggle between four wheel drive or all wheel drive all-wheel drive sport, which transfers about 70% of the torque to the back, and then you can go rear-wheel drive and it will decouple through the multi-plate clutch to send all the power to the back. And then you get the M differential, which is yet another multi-plate clutch differential in the back to be able to slip and transfer power as you need it. And that is one of the most amazing parts of this because it's twofold. With the all-wheel drive setup, it gives you the insane ability to launch it like you saw. Mm -hmm. And let's take a look at that, by the way. <laughs> let's see this thing take off from the line against one of the most fiercest competitors on the road. This is how it all started, bro. Yes, it did. Did you get a tune in that thing finally? Don't worry about it. I'll give you a half hour start. F this guy. I'm smoking them. Hey. 
So you're able to see how, I mean, without zero, with zero effort to get this thing off the line and achieve that, like, what is it, zero to 60 in like three seconds? 3.3 3 seconds or something. And that's what? It's fast. It's really fast. And if you just want to do a smoke show, you put in two-wheel drive. And you I wish I would have tried it in two-wheel drive, but I never, I mean, I didn't want to burn up the tires. Yeah. And that's I mean, all I, you would do. Right. I mean, it would just, it would be a smoke show. But that's what's cool about this is it gives somebody the ability that doesn't have a lot of driving skill to just kind of lean on the all-wheel drive system and let the, let all the electronics do their thing and moving power where it needs to go. Or if you're somebody that can drive, you can go on track and put it in rear-wheel drive and kind of have fun that way. I did it in both. <clears throat> so what'd you think? Well, of course. It's, I don't know. No, I might have got my hat dirty. <laughs> it's entertaining in two-wheel drive. And four-wheel drive, this, or four-wheel drive sport, whatever, was pretty good. They did a really good job. <clears throat> so I think that's the main takeaway from the all-wheel drive system. You might think that it's a negative, but it adds functionality there to people that aren't hardcore, and it gives you the ability to drive this year-round. If somebody <laughs> you know, is concerned about having rear-wheel <clears throat> drive in the winter, you do have a usable setup for that now. And of course, the byproduct is it adds a lot of weight, which this car is truthfully not all that concerned about, I don't think, in development. When you look at the next part of it is you getting the M Sport exhaust standard and these pipes are sewer pipes. Yeah, these <laughs> sewer pipes in here could be used to deliver waste matter to your local <laughs> municipality because they are so thick. Uh, <laughs> it has the active flap, it has different tuning, and this exhaust is much more throaty than the I M5. think it sounds good. I think it sounds great. And it, of course, if you're somebody that is juvenile, it will make all the farting sounds and crackles and pops when you're just rubbing it in neutral and sport plus when you know all the m modes that's if you can figure out how to put it in neutral yeah exactly <laughs> if you can figure out how to set all the modes first Excuse me. <clears throat> the next part you're going to see is the rear suspension you have a five link a multi-link which has five links this is like a plastic box on my side well yeah i took off the uh control arm cover for airflow so you can see the suspension here you have a split lower control arm that is all aluminum for your what is that? Scott? A fucking sway bar link. That's right, a plastic <laughs> composite sway bar link. Your knuckle is all aluminum. The upright is aluminum. Your shock body is aluminum. The only thing that you see here that is stamped steel are these toe arms. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> well, it's probably the carryover from the regular 5 Series. Remember the M3s did that? They're like, oh, the only thing we used was the toe arms because it doesn't make any difference. So you'll see stuff like that. But th the main thing that stands out back here is this unbelievably meaty rear subframe carrier that's Look all how aluminum. nicely it's done too i know it, it's it, it almost looks like a piece of art it is i mean just look, look at those curves i know it's a really <clears throat> nice piece and you don't typically see this in pretty much any car and it's indicative of the price point of this um and then there's other things like you know you have your cross brace you have your rear diffuser ports to flow air out the back, which your control arm covers help to kind of direct air to smooth it out towards the exhaust. So there is a ton of aerodynamics that went into this car, uh, suspension design, and pretty much everything was thought out to make this as high performance as possible. You did a good job. Scott, under the hood. What are we looking at here? A bunch of freaking plastic, man. Holy Christ. There is no humanly way that any person is going to work on this. Can we take the turbos off real quick and look at them? You can't see them from the bottom. You can't see them from the top. This thing, I cannot believe how... there. There's literally no space to put no. anything. Well, that's why when you go just run to Starbucks real quick and come back, and you park this thing and the fan's blowing a million miles an hour. So when we drove this thing, anytime you drive it hard, immediately... It wasn't even driving it hard, it would do that sometimes. Yeah, the fan will run after you turn it off, and you'll get a, a, a warning in the gauge cluster that the hood's going to be extremely hot when you open right. it if you're running. And I mean, there is just an insane amount of engine in this compartment. Uh, this is a vehicle that you are never going to work on yourself. This has to be the true epitome of a lease only car if there is one you can see just how much this car is counterintuitive like they the what they were able to do was amazing but it's the reverse of how you would think a sports car should be made usually you start with low weight you strip it's basically less is more for a sports right. car this 
is more is less. Well, that's how they yeah. get it creamy. <laughs> creamy and all the marketing lingo that they throw out in the press releases. But I will say this, you have to treat this M5 as though you're buying a supercar. That that's really what that's this is. That's a good is. way to put it. You look at this car compared to 10 years ago what the M5 was, this, the, what they did here was so far advanced like in terms of electronics, the all-wheel drive system, the interior stuff, the differentials, the engine. This feels like a normal car. You know, usually you see an evolution, a small evolution. This jumped ahead like two generations or three mm -hmm. generations, um, at least in terms of performance. It's crazy. It is definitely silky smooth entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> With that said, let's head out on the road. <laughs> Welcome to a quick drive on the street with the new M5 competition package. And we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons that you would want to know just getting this on the road. I'm with Jack Singapore. Let's start off by saying you and I have a dramatically different opinion on this car. Yes, I would say that. <laughs> uh, yours is a little less positive than mine. I think that's also a fair opinion. Yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. Uh, in before we get into some of those differences, we need to talk about what this thing is like tooling around every day. Because when you strip away the fact that... <laughs> all it does is fart. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. You're gonna break a stool loose. I know. When you strip away the sound of the exhaust, you strip away some of the other things like the acceleration and all that, you're left with what is an extremely expensive 5 Series. So the suspension, it is pretty firm without being overly firm and you have a plethora of different suspension settings here to kind of get it more comfortable. But even when you're in the comfort mode, I find that it is a little bit too stiff, and specifically in the back seat, I did not have fun riding back there as a passenger. I so think that's, that's a, I mean, that's due to the fact that it's a competition package. A lot of the problems with the ride in this car will be solved by not getting the comp package. Yeah, just getting the regular M5 or a 5 Series, and, and that should solve some of that. Just put M5 badges all over it. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Yes, that is pretty damn fun to do that. So let's get on to the next part, the steering. On the street, you don't really notice it. I, I mean, there's there's three different steering modes. You have Sport, Sport Plus, the normal setting, and really it's like every other electromechanical or electronic power steering rack in modern vehicles. It's set up where you feel nothing from the road. Now they have made some changes here so you, you feel something but it, it's so minimal and it's so sloppy and it just, it's more of a luxury car steering feel than something you would expect from a sports car. And but when you get it in higher modes though, it is fairly direct to be, to it, be oh, fair to it. It's super direct. I'm just talking more about steering feedback and overall connectedness with the road, which doesn't really exist here. <laughs> the next part is transmission performance. And yes, this is one of the things that BMW has mastered. It is tremendous. It's basically five years ago, you would associate this with supercar levels of <laughs> automated manual performance. And it's super smooth when you're driving regular. And of course you can adjust shift speed, which BMW is really good about doing. On normal driving, it is buttery smooth, and then when you want to take manual control, there is zero disappointment here. You won't miss the twin clutch in the previous generation. It has none of the negatives of the twin clutch from before. Like, it'll creep through traffic, it's a regular automatic, and this thing just deals out shifts. It's oh, it, it does. It's, it's remarkable how good it is, and I'd say that's one of the highlights of driving this on the street. Now, obviously, when you take off, upshifts, downshifts are quick. I'm just going to launch it here really quick. That's kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. 
and that is the miracle of two-wheel drive. And the, all that did was just leave a patch of rubber on the ground. <laughs> I mean, you felt nothing. Like, the car was going straight. You felt nothing. You heard nothing. And it's just leaving rubber behind and a little bit of smoke. That's how refined this car is. And I think that's going to lead me into kind of our discussion. This car is basically the Hellcat with a master's degree, right? It is the Hellcat devoid of fun, unfortunately. I mean... If you are an utter goon, I guess like you and I are, there is fun to be had, right? It'll go sideways, it'll overrun, it makes great noises, but at the same time, it lacks the sense of humor of the Hellcat, right? I mean, it takes itself really seriously. It's got a V8, a twin-turbo V8. It's got a great automatic transmission. It's got an exhaust that pops and farts, but you feel, or I feel, absolutely nothing driving this car. I feel like anything that there was supposed to be fun injected in here... <laughs> okay, aside from that, <laughs> everything else, when you're driving every single day, you feel like you've been shot up with some type of anesthetic. But to be fair, think of what this car is trying to accomplish, and I think this is where you and I are going to disagree, right? The guy who's buying this car, can, or, or woman, right, can afford a $133,000 car, right? So they're probably making $400,000, $500,000 a year. They probably already have another sports car, a GT3, a Ferrari, or, you know, a C4 Corvette pace car, right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and they're using this as their daily that they can tailgate and traffic with and, you know, experience 617 horsepower. If you look at it as a daily and you have fuck you money, there isn't a whole lot to complain about other than the fact that it's a little devoid of fun. But, you know, if you drove something like a Hellcat, you complain about the interior, the... Right. The shitty ride, well, actually, the ride quality is pretty decent, but you know what I mean. All, all, the, all the negatives that you could say about that car are remedied in this, but you lose all the soul. Yeah, I think that that's my my issue with it. Is I guess okay if you have a true sports car that you don't want to drive every day because it's horrible in traffic. Not well, not that that a 911 would be horrible in traffic, but you have something a little bit more hardcore, like your Grand Sport Corvette or a Z Z06 or Corvette. your Adam. Yeah, something that is ridiculous. You don't want to drive it every day. You get in this and you get a lot of the elements of those car in a quiet, sedate, comfortable package, and then you can drive like a straight up ape if you want to. And that's what this does best. But to me, it still feels like a friggin' 5 Series that has just been souped up to the gills. And I just feel bored. I feel like this is a boring experience, and I just can't get over that. Even if you made $500,000 a year, would you consider its competitors, the E63 and the Panamera, would you buy this or not? I, I mean, it, that personally, that that's a personal question because I can't answer that for everybody. But for me, I would just much rather have a regular 5 Series. Save the costs of all the consumables, all those things. Have a regular 5 Series that's going to give you everything this has with some of the performance that you can't even utilize on the street anyway. And then save a ton of money and put it towards a more dedicated sports car that I can have fun with on the weekends. But I understand if you want an all-in-one vehicle that can do everything that literally can be a luxury car on the street and then go tear up a racetrack, there, there's not a lot of cars that can do it as good as the M5 or the M5 competition. No, I agree with you. My, my one comment about this is the competition package that's on this car is pointless. I, I, I would, for if all you're gonna do is street drive, if you just want that badge, you're paying a lot of money extra for, to get that badge, but if all you're gonna do is street drive, the M5 is gonna handle pretty much anything and if you don't care about that, you just get a regular 5 Series and be done. Let's head out onto the track and talk about some of the things that the M5 competition can and can't do. When you talk about M cars, specifically the M5, when they throw a competition badge on it, there's only so much you can do with a vehicle like this on the street. And it is so ridiculously fast that I wanted to take it out on track, 
not really to set any times, but to kind of explore the more ridiculous side of its handling and, of course, the straight line acceleration. The first thing that I'm noticing on track is, despite whatever steering mode I'm choosing, it just, you know, it's totally numb. It feels so synthetic. I mean, it's not that it doesn't do what you want it to do, but it's like, I mean, there's so much play in this steering wheel, regardless of my mode, that I, I just don't like the, the steering part of it. Now, granted, this is a big, it's a big sedan. So, you know, obviously the people that are gonna buy this aren't gonna wanna be muscling the steering wheel around, but you notice it when you're driving more hardcore. The second part is the handling for the weight of this is a big, big surprise. I mean, it feels so good for, <laughs> for how large it is. And one of the guys that was in the car said, it feels like this, this vehicle has like a cheater mode button because you literally have to do nothing to drive it fast. And when you downshift, It's like supercar fast. I'm not kidding you. I, it reminds me a lot of the McLaren 570S that I drove. And you know, it, it doesn't have the sound of course and all of that, but it definitely has the raw acceleration in a straight line. It just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. And as a consequence, you annihilate these brakes. I mean, literally, after about two or three laps tops, they are scorching hot, scorching hot. So this is the carbon ceramic option, which is even worse because if you go through these, you are in big trouble. Now, damping, you know, obviously there is so many different modes in this vehicle. Right now I'm driving in four wheel drive sport, which is balancing the power for more aggressive driving, making it more rear biased. And you can put it in straight four wheel drive, which makes it more front wheel drive biased. But I'm gonna throw it into two wheel drive, which puts the most bias to the rear and see how it handles putting the power down. gets any sideways here. Jesus, man, nothing. Not a problem at all. Damn, this is something else for its size. Holy shit. God, it does. It feels like straight up cheater mode, zero effort. I mean, you can get it sideways, of course. And you know, you just have to be a little bit stupid to get it sideways and can control a drift. And I'm not gonna destroy the tires. All you need to know is 600 horsepower, set it to two wheel drive mode and fiddle with all your M settings and you're gonna have a lot of fun. Final thoughts on the BMW M5 competition. And congratulations to you, you made it to the end of an extremely long video. So hopefully some of this was helpful. Now, instead of rehashing all this, I'm just gonna go over the pros and cons. And the pros are this. This is a massive technical achievement for BMW. Not only is the mechanical engineering amazing, the drivetrain, the electronic programming, the overall ride, and just Everything to do with performance is staggering. Every single person that got into this, regardless of skill level, 
felt extremely comfortable driving it fast, and that is very hard to do. Johnny America said it feels like this car is fully enabled cheater mode. You can get on a track and go flat out, and the electronics are gonna save you, they're gonna keep you in check, and even if you are a seasoned driver, you throw, turn everything off, put in rear wheel drive mode, at no point do you ever feel like this thing is gonna lose control, track or street. And that makes this very appealing to somebody that doesn't have a high driving skill. You can utilize every single amount of horsepower and torque from this motor. And that is, again, very hard to do. Now, let's get on to the cons. The cons are this. This is a firm riding vehicle. If you're expecting some extremely plush luxury car ride, you're not going to get it. In the back seat, even on the softest setting, you feel like you want to get out of the car. The Driver and passenger seat are skewed towards the more sporty side. Of course, if you're driving aggressively, you'd want these seats. But on long, long, long road trips, you're probably going to have to break these seats in a little bit more. Now, my biggest complaint, as much as the electronics are great, they are also a hindrance. If you are a driver that wants a little bit more of a pure experience, there's too much shit to turn on and off. You got multi-level traction, stability control, you have all the all-wheel drive settings, all the individual settings for all the steering, engine, uh, the exhaust mode. It's just so frustrating. And I know that you're gonna own this long-term and you're probably gonna get it set and never touch it again. But if you're looking at this, you have to just take a look at all the safety stuff, all the electronics and see if you can get past that and appreciate some of the good of the car. Now, pretty much everything else, this is like a five series. And I think that's one of the biggest negatives. This is a straight up sleeper car. It, oftentimes I just looked at it, I was, I was just bored with it. I was bored looking at it, I was bored with the interior, even though the interior lighting is great at night. It just seems like it needs more flair and the exhaust was not enough. But if you like that, you want the more understated, like just demon car, the M5 competition is yours. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. See you next time. Savage geese. What a waste of skin. Man, we got to get rid of this guy. I'm going to show you how, but first, let's tune this Subaru. I think 60 PSI should be good. Yeah. Let's do it! It's off. No, it's on. It's off. I've, I got my light off. DSC is active. Here. DSC off. You have to hold it. There's only... There we go. It's not always off. Because the stupid screen turned, I accidentally knocked the window.